Okay, so this is lecture number 41. Uh, currently, the final lecture in the series about creating an international sustainable civilization. Um, most of this one is going back to Capra and Luisi's book about uh, systems thinking. I have throughout these lectures pointed out that the view is consistent with systems thinking. Every once in a while, I quote from systems thinking. Early on, I quoted quite a bit. And so this last lecture is going to go back and remind people of what's been said or else just to weave together everything um, into this final paradigm shift. And the main here thing here is a paradigm shift in the way we look at reality, both the universe the biosphere, our human nature, the human condition, human culture, where we're at now, where we need to go, how to get there. Um, and their book, A Systems View of, of Life, um, a systems related to a systems view of life is really important in putting all those pieces together. Their book has many pieces and it's extremely complex and thorough and I really appreciate it. I don't know how popular it will get, but I hope so. I also don't know how many other types of systems thinking are out there. I think some of them have to do with AI as a system computer systems, you know, technological systems. I mean, everything is a system. And so we have realized that everything is connected to everything else, but oftentimes again, with our hyper-specialization, that, that interconnectedness systems thinking starts out with a set of assumptions, all right? And those assumptions aren't don't connect us back to integrating nature and culture. They're just a subdivide of culture that once again detaches itself from nature, the human condition, the broader, you know, the global thinking. Okay, so, so um, let me start us out. Okay, here's the whole list of lectures, just uh, Marif, Marif's book, Aristotle, Ponchisilla number one, uh, and Ponchisilla number three, inclusiveness. Number two, you know, the humanitarianism is Aristotle. It's woven through everything. Um, then the the inclusiveness, that would be number three, unity and diversity, and also deliberation, bringing everybody to the table to talk. Uh, then there's the conference at the Pontifical Academy and linking all of this to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Then we go back to Marif and um, it's humanism versus dualism, there's how to pass on this wisdom to the next generation, the legacy, how to, you know, he's worried about his legacy, overcoming colonialism. Now, Mari spotted that kind of corruption. It's true in every colonized country. And then capitalism, how it still is a very corrupting influence today. Um, the importance of university community engagement projects is really big in my mind the role of the professorate in culture, um, then the fact that the first step in losing democracies is polarization, and that the USA and Indonesia have very similar trends in how we're losing our democracy, and we should compare and contrast. Um, Panchasila, as opposed to toxic culture, um, how capitalism is destroying our bodies, making us mentally ill, um, 
okay? And then the prophetic tradition, the prophets. What are the trends for all the prophets? How can Confucius be considered a prophet? How Confucius analects have been used to support democracy or to support Chinese authoritarian uh, form of government, single party. Then there's Hinduism and there's Gandhi as a, a Hindu prophet and the effect of colonialism on Gandhi's life early on, his recognition of it, his rejection of it. Then there's Buddhism and um and I emphasize um, Buddha's, the connection between Buddha's life story and Jesus coming of age. Very amazing. Um, and then Buddhist meditation and how it is based on science. It's evidence-based. And there's a lot of contemporary uh, brain, brain studies on the brain that have shown that Buddhism meditation techniques really are effective in reducing stress. And, and developing integrity and wisdom. Then there's Jesus, um, Sermon on the Mount, Martin Luther King as a modern prophet, referring also to Old Testament, New Testament, Muhammad as a prophet, what happened after 9-11 and what sort of um, articles were in the New York Times, what, what, uh, the 9-11, what does it tell us about the role of liberal education, how important liberal education is? Are we a democracy or a polity? Which one is better? And then today, systems thinking. So I'm going to go into systems thinking um, and talk about that for a while. Then we'll be done uh, unless I decide to add things. I hope not. I hope this will be closure on this, and then I'll just start another um, play playlist, another class, basically. All right, so um, Capra, a social paradigm, is a constellation of concepts, values, perceptions, practices shared by a community, which forms a particular vision of reality that is the basis of the way the community organizes itself. And so there are better and worse uh, social paradigms, uh, ways of interaction, ways of creating social networks. The modern mechanistic and material worldview is destroying life on earth. Developing nations are suffering the most, while the way of thinking does not change, even when the destructive consequences become more and more obvious. I focus on Aristotle because Capra affirms Aristotle's basic foundation his ideas of causality in the natural world, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, that's compatible with the systems view. All right. How do we get from science as providing the ability for everyone to flourish to science as the weapon of the destruction of life? Most of what scientists do today is not life furthering and life preserving, but life destroying. Physicists are designing weapons of math destruction, chemists are contaminating the global environment, biologists are releasing new and unknown types of microorganisms without knowing the consequences, psychologists and other scientists are torturing animals in the name of scientific progress. With all of these activities going on, it seems most urgent to introduce an eco-ethical standards into science. But those aren't just superimposed. Those bring us back to the wisdom traditions and they bring us back to the union of culture and nature. They bring us back to forming a microcosm in the macrocosm in our minds. The transition from earth as a sacred mother, the giver of life to earth as a resource to be exploited without any limits. The image of the earth as a living organism and a nurturing mother served, this is Carol Merchant is being quoted in Copper's book. Um, the image of earth as a living organism and nurturing mother served as a cultural constraint restric restricting the actions of human beings. One does not readily slay a mother, dig into her entrails for gold or mutilate her body. 
as long as the earth was considered to be alive and sensitive, it could be considered a breach of human ethical behavior to carry out destructive acts against it. So for 30,000 years, um, culture as culture emerged, it was centered on life, uh, goddess-centered. So there is evidence that um, bef before Hinduism, before the rise of patriarchy, before this consciousness uh, in the axial age, and even, you know, it, the rise of patriarchy was way before that. But uh, for 30,000 years, um, the it was goddess-centered. It wasn't worshiping a goddess so much because the goddess isn't separated from you. It was just recognizing the living force of the goddess inside of you, around you, in the universe. It was integrity, like the whole thing fit together. You didn't have to separate the spiritual from the physical at all. And Aristotle really didn't. If he thinks every physical thing is driven by, uh, uh, is driven toward perfection, toward its final cause, and fitting in to whatever already exists, there is a drive toward life, higher and higher forms of life, flourishing, well-being, built right into our bodies. Physical reality does not move itself. Uh, it doesn't structure itself. Um, and the modern world taught that matter is inert. Bacon, the ancient concept of the earth as nurturing mother was radically transformed in Bacon's writings and eventually it disappeared. I think that's really important. Galileo's program offers us a dead world. Uh, out of sight, out go sight, sound, taste, touch, and smell. Along with them have since gone aesthetic and ethical sensibility, values, quality, soul, consciousness, spirit. Experience as such is cast out of the realm of scientific discourse. It's not attached to any way of life. You can have any way of life at all and be a good scientist. Um, hardly anything has changed our world more during the past 400 years than Galileo's audacious program. We had to destroy the world in theory before we could destroy it in practice. Again, my emphasis is the importance of ideas, the power of ideas. So this is you know, probably the major theme in my class on um, with the Western intellectual tradition, the replacement of Aristotle by the modern view, and then the modern view doesn't set any limits to the exploitation of nature or the manipulation of people. And now we have what we have. With the scientific revolution and the enlightenment, critical reasoning, empiricism, individualism, became the dominant values. Nobody's against critical thinking, but the context. Together with a secular, it was linked with a secular and materialistic orientation that led to the production of worldly goods and luxuries and to the manipulative mentality of the industrial age. So the manipulation that uh, the hacking of the American mind the myth of uh, normal and the um, anxious generation that those authors document started way before that. The propaganda, uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew write a, wrote a book about propaganda and um, was very aware of how if you take Freud's view of the psyche that our id is repressed and we project it, we deny it, project it. And that is the antithesis of what the ancients wanted. They didn't want you to repress or deny. They wanted you to recognize your capacity for uh, extreme behavior, for sexual abuse, for um, fear, for all that stuff, and then flush it out. So recognize it recognize what damage it does, flush it out. 
So the ancient view wanted integrity, humanism. It wanted people to want to be completely human, which would mean uh, transforming those primitive drives into something civilized. And Freud just said repress until later on in his life, he beyond the pleasure principle, he actually started to believe people could get beyond it. But most of what you associate Freud with, and then his nephew took that view, the repression view, and started to develop propaganda that triggered those repressed sexual drives or fear or dopamine, all that wonderful stuff, pleasure. Now we have an even more refined uh, neuromarketing and um, capitalist propaganda, military propaganda, political propaganda. Okay, the new customs and activities in the industrial age resulted in the creation of new social and political institutions that gave rise to a new academic pursuit, theorizing about a set of specific economic activities production, exchange, distribution, money lending, which suddenly stood out in sharp relief and required not only description and explanation, but also rationalization. So before that, economic life took place in the home and parents taught their children to natural acquisition, not wanting or having things you don't need and uh, versus unnatural acquisition which is wanting more than you need and um, valuing consumption as such. Okay. Max Weber um, talked then about, so, I mean, you have the science Galileo, you have the formation of a network that's just related to economics. Then you have Weber talking about the culture and the development of this capitalist mentality the notion of moral obligation to fulfill one's duty in worldly endeavors, which is God, John Locke, chapter five of the second treatise on government. God wanted us to exploit um, the earth and a rational and industrious person does that. And the Native Americans did not. They were lazy and contentious. So it was God's will for you to drive them off the land and if they fought back, God would want you to slaughter them, massacre them, genocide, that's just fine, unless they go along with the program. The material uh, rewards resulting from industrious behavior, exploiting nature as a sign of divine predestination. Thus arose the famous Protestant work ethic and John Locke was Protestant and this was right. That's why Pope Francis, has his uh, the Catholic view is Aristotelian. It has natural law. And that's why Francis is very involved with environmental protection. That's why the Vatican sponsored this conference. Um, it, the Protestant work ethic in which hard self-denying work and worldly success were equated with virtue. So it's anti-sensual all that energy that you might give to enjoying being alive, you just uh, focus on making money, on capitalism, on working for profit. On the other hand, the Puritans abhorred all but the most frugal consumption. Consequently, the accumulation of wealth was sanctioned. It was sanctified. It was virtue. It was what got you to heaven. The destruction of nature was considered the highest virtue which again justified Western colonialism and exploitation of developing nations like Indonesia. Aristotle condemned greed and he had a different view of material acquisition. It was connected to the household, the difference between wants and needs, it's common sense. Westerners will not give up this worldview. At the center of the global economy is a network of financial flows which has been designed, this is Capra, even today, like his book was published 2019, 
20, between 2015, 2019, I can't remember, um, without any ethical framework. Just in fact, social inequality and social exclusion are inherent features of economic globalization, widening the gap between the rich and the poor, increasing world poverty, without claiming to have any particular ethical point of view, because morals are relative. Each culture has its different ideas of good and evil. We'll just keep building the economy and, you know, whatever. Oh, boy, that's so corrupt. The continuing illusion of unlimited growth on a finite planet. In the name of moral relativism or detached observers is the fundamental dilemma at the roots of all the major problems of our time. This largely unconscious embrace of the mechanistic approach to management has now become one of the main obstacles to organizational change. So if it's unconscious, that could mean it's tragic good intentions. But the more obvious the consequences are, the more accountable people are to its willed ignorance, right? It shouldn't, they should not, you know, they should say, whoops, I have sort of these values not thinking, and now I got to think, okay? The modern view of rationality is the goal of life, is the ability to calculate the most efficient means to your own economic well-being. The ancient view of wisdom is the exact opposite. Most philosophy taught in the West is modern. There are very few centers for systems thinking or for writing a dissertation on systems thinking. And then even um, some of the conservatives will uh, co-opt Aristotle and bring Aristotle into this worldview, which is really unfair. <laughs> Mechanistic thinking versus the web of life. The clash between linear thinking and the non-linear patterns in our biosphere. The ecological networks and cycles that constitute the web of life. There are actually three kinds of growth that have severe impacts on our natural environment and our well-being. Economic growth, corporate growth, and population growth. The illusion of the viability of unlimited growth is maintained by economists who refuse to include the social and environmental costs of economic activities in their theories. Consequently, there are huge differences between market price and true costs, as for example, the cost of fossil fuels, which in the US is, is $8 trillion for our um, episodes in the Mideast, which we never would have gone there if it weren't for fossil fuels. Aristotle's biological works, and this was another point. That point is a point that David Orr also made. Aristotle's biological works were based on the great chain of being an early examination of the web of life. His view is that we, by nature, desire to understand the universe, not exploit it, because it is understandable. Ultimately, deep ecological awareness is spiritual awareness. When the concept of the human spirit is understood as the mode of consciousness in which the individual feels a sense of belonging, of connectedness to the cosmos as a whole, it becomes clear that ecological awareness is spiritual in its deepest sense. Hence, the emerging new vision of reality based on deep ecological awareness is consistent with the so-called perennial philosophy of spiritual traditions. And that consciousness leads to an ethic, good and evil. It's bad to exploit nature for your greed. It's bad to kill animals indiscriminately. It's good to work towards sustainability. I mean, this is not, you know, just a detached observer view of reality. It contains with it an entire ethos, everything about good and evil, an entire, an entire culture where good and evil education, good and evil leisure time activities, good and evil health care, it all... It has an ethic, a notion of good and evil built into it. It just doesn't come across as an ethic series of principles that you impose on people. 
or um, a series of utilitarian consequences to maximize happiness, meaning whatever people think makes them happy at the time. It's a view of reality that says, given this, to be good is to gain, have a mind and insist on an integrated integration of culture and nature. To be bad is to lose your mind and go to war against nature. Um, care flows naturally if the self is widened and deepened so that protection of free nature is felt and conceived as protection of ourself. Right? So this is the idea that an ethic, good and evil, is built into this fact about the universe. Just as we need no morals to make us breathe, so if yourself in the wide sense embraces another being, you need no moral exhortation to show care. You care for yourself without feeling any moral pressure to do it. There's no gap between caring for yourself and caring for others. Creating a, a system that will preserve life on earth is helping yourself as well as helping everybody else and every living thing. Greek spiritual humanism is based on the view that our evolution led to higher and higher kinds of social interaction, culture, and that the more we're able to exercise these capacities, the happier we are. We are truly flourishing. The love of wisdom is what makes us happy. Greed destroys everything. Okay. Um, all right. Conclusion. I hope this series of lectures can convince Indonesians that they have something to offer the world in their political ideology, their culture, and their understanding of Islam. I hope graduates of UN schools and professors there can educate students to be lovers of democracy, of wisdom, um, of systems thinking, and of Panchasila. They need to explain the connections uh, and also of the sustainable development goals to write books and articles that provide a vision of how to fit all of these together they need to pick up Marif's legacy and his call to develop a curriculum for Mahamadiya schools that fits with what the world needs now. Indonesian scholars should become engaged with the United Nations in the development of a curriculum for creating a sustainable global culture, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I wish you well. If people have been following this lecture series that aren't, from UN schools in Indonesia that aren't from Indonesia, I would hope they can understand that this applies to everyone all around the world. We're all in this together and it's going to be incredibly difficult to turn around the paradigm before it's too late. Um, and if, if we manage to do it, it has to just happen suddenly. Um, there has to be in chaos theory, there's in nonlinear, there's this, you know, moving towards something and then suddenly it all comes together. So I'm hoping we can have a leap in um, sustainable development. Finally, enough people will get it. And they'll get serious enough about it, but not right now, not in 2024, as we approach the possible re-election of Donald Trump. The fever has not broken. We have not gotten through to people enough. But I hope it does. And um, take care. And I hope all of you can, can um, find meaning and purpose in some aspect. Whatever else you do, whatever sector of society, you want to include sustainability as an, a basic foundation of how you conduct yourself in 